Ua oki oki koa o he ia nei a puni ho i ka honua makapuna i wele, aloha nui kakou. O wau keia o Kele Gonzalez, he luna ho opono pono o ka hale pai o ka meha meha. I have the great honor of moderating this Hawaii Book and Music Festival panel on the Mo'olelo Hawaii of the Vida Malo, which consists of two volumes, Ka'olelo Kumu, edited by Jeffrey Lyon, and Hawaiian Text and Translation, edited and translated by Charles Langless and Jeffrey Lyon, with a new biographical essay by Noilani Arista. These were published earlier this year by University of Hawaii Press and Bishop Museum Press. Professor Emeritus John Charlotte writes, no single Hawaiian language work has been more influential than David Malo's Kamo'olelo Hawaii. Jeffrey Kapali Lyon is a chair of the Department of Religion at the University of Hawaii at Manoa and the editor of the journal Palapala. Following the publication of the two volume Mo'olelo Hawaii of Davida Malo, he and Charles Langless have been working on a new edition of Kelo Kamakau's early description of Hawaiian religion. Looking forward to that. Dr. Charles Kale Langness was formerly an associate professor at Kahaka Ulo Ke'elikolani College of Hawaiian Language, now retired. Originally, he trained as an anthropologist and has done ethnographic research in New Guinea, at Kalapana on Hawaii Islands, and at Kalaupapa Moloka'i. Noelani Arista is an associate professor of Hawaiian and U.S. history at UH Manoa. Her book, The Kingdom and the Republic, Sovereign Hawaii and the Early United States, was awarded the Best Book Award of 2020 by the Native American and Indigenous Studies Association. Her work centers on the transmediation of mo'olelo from orality to digital mediums. Okay, that's our presenters. For the ho'ike, Kale will start us off with a general description of the two volumes and the nature of the work, followed by Kapali, who will speak on the multiple sources of the Malo text, and then we'll learn about Malo, the Kanaka from Noilani. Aoya e Kale, take us away. As Kapali, as um, Kiele has stated, there are two volumes in our work. Uh, the first volume, uh, volume one by Kapali is entirely in Hawaiian. It has images of Malo's handwritten manuscript on the left-hand side page. And on the right-hand side page, two columns. The first column has a typescript of the Hawaiian exactly as Malo wrote it. And the second column has a modernized and edited Hawaiian um, done by us. Um, there's also introductory background material in volume one. Volume two, the slimmer of the volumes, has on the left-hand side, the modernized Hawaiian text, and on the right-hand side, the English translation. It also contains Noilani's big biography of Malo, and it has a considerable background material as well in the introduction, uh, describing the nature of our work, the history of the manuscript, and some analysis of Kamo'olelo Hawaii by David Malo. This was actually a 20-year project David Malo's Kamo'olelo Hawaii is perhaps the most important of the early works written by Hawaiians. It's important for two reasons. It's first of all, because it's so early. Uh, secondly, because it's encyclopedic. Uh, Malo was born in 1795, which means that as he was growing up, he saw the reign of Kamehameha. Uh, before there were huge changes to Hawaiian politi politics and culture um, brought by the uh, overthrow of the Kapu system in 1819 and the conversion of Hawaiians to Christianity following 1820. Um, he wrote somewhat later in 1841 to 1853, but he wrote about what he had learned earlier. Secondly, um, as I said, it's encyclopedic. Um, Malo covers a wide range of topics. Uh, in comparison to Kamakau, Kilo Kamakau, that is, who wrote only on religion. I want to turn now to the nature of our work. Of course, the first task was to type up Malo's Hawaiian, but then we had to edit and modernize his Hawaiian for uh, the current generation of Hawaiian speakers and readers. Um, we added diacritical marks, the okina and the kahako, because people uh, find it easier to read that rather than having to guess which of 
several possible meanings uh, might be meant if the Okina and Kahako are left out. Uh, most importantly, we revised the punctuation. Malo did not use periods except at the end of a paragraph. Um, so you have to guess if you're reading his original where a sentence ends and the next one begins. And that often means you have to go back and, and ponder for a while before you figure it out. So we added periods where we thought the sentences ended. Um, we also sometimes needed to condense words. Um, sometimes Malo did not, sometimes he did not um, write a word all in one piece. For example, this one here, um, Malo wrote a ah, space ua space ne, which is pretty puzzling uh, to a Hawaiian speaker and reader. It doesn't really make sense. Um, if you put it together, it becomes obvious that it means awane'i, which means soon. Um, another problem that we found, there were some places where there were writing errors and some of them uh, due to what was apparently Malo's dysgraphia, he would sometimes reverse syllables as for example here, where he might have written lapa when he meant to write pala. And you can pretty much tell from the context in those cases. Uh, having done that, having edited uh, Malo Hawaiian, uh, the next task of course was to translate it into English. We tried to remain faithful to the Hawaiian but to avoid awkwardness in the English. Um, that sounds easier than it is actually. Um, sometimes because of, because the, um, the sequence of phrases and words in Hawaiian is different from what it is in English, it, it's difficult to turn uh, what looks like a fairly nice Hawaiian sentence into a nice sounding English sentence. This, probably reflects a larger problem. And that is that with a language as different as Hawaiian is from English, the whole categorization of the world is different. So you're always having a problem in trying to convert a Hawaiian word and a Hawaiian concept to something in English. Focus on, uh, on the, uh, the building of the Hawaiian text. Of course, it's impossible to make a good translation if you don't have a reliable text. And Malo's text was uh, in many ways pretty messy. Malo uh, worked on his book for many, many years. Many of the circumstances are still unknown to us. Uh, when he died, it was incomplete. And so we can sort of, by looking at all these clues, place where the manuscript is and, 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 and go back to its history and establish that this clearly is the text that we ought to follow. And for the most part, we really have. In volume one, uh, it, it really is the, we print pictures of it and show uh, a transcription of it. And, and then anywhere that it differs from the Hawaiian text that Kali and I agreed upon, we show differences there. Uh, uh, as I said, I think this is the first time that, that a, a Hawaiian text has received, uh, been treated as a critical text. Now, usually it's not necessary because most Hawaiian texts are taken from newspapers and there really is not a language, his, uh, a manuscript history to follow. But for this, the, 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 the really the manuscript is so important and so critical to uh, understanding uh, uh, pre-Christian Hawaiian society uh, that we've given it, we spent many, many years, really had to learn to read a 19th century, an early 19th century Hawaiian manuscript. Our, our training in Hawaiian classes, our training in reading Hawaiian literature really didn't prepare us for us and there was no way it could. Uh, we found out that, that Hawaiians who were writing at this time, especially Malo, they're, they're not writing under the same uh, character, uh, the same reason, uh, ways that we go about writing. We know how to spell a word. We know where word ends break. We know what, we're taught these from the very beginning. Malo did not go to, uh, did not learn writing until he was an adult. And like many early Hawaiians, it's a form of self-dictation. You hear the word in your mind and you write out the sounds. Where does the word break? Where does the word end? What kind of punctuation to use? Uh, Malo puts in all kinds of commas 
in places that people would not do today. It's a kind of a, a performance thing that when you, you say a thing and take a pause and repeat it and, and give emphasis to it, Malo uses commas to represent things like that. Anyway, we had to learn all of this from scratch. And we hope that the result is that the Hawaiian text that's, that's printed in volume two and which our translation is based is as, is as accurate and has given, been given as much attention as we possibly can give it. And uh, that, uh, with that, uh, I'll turn it over to Noe Lani. Today, my approach to writing about, to talking about uh, the piece that I wrote, the biographical piece that I wrote on David Malo is to present slides that say one thing while presenting um, a script that I wrote that is largely taken from my, my writing. Um, my piece was called David Amalo, A Hawaiian Life. And in this essay, I sort of um, focus on his life as a chiefly counselor. It may be a singular irony that David Amalo is known to readers primarily as the author of this very important text, Kamo'olelo Hawaii, which was first published in 1897 some 44 years after his death. Malo, however, had a more capacious view of his various occupations. He, he himself said that he had been a companion of the chiefs, a counselor for them at times, a school teacher, sugar planter, and a now, now a licensed preacher. Another employment of his was to treasure up the mele, native songs, and rehearse them, and to treasure up the genealogies of the chiefs. Kamo'olelo Hawaii, the text that we've been discussing up until now, is a work that was never published in Malo's lifetime, either in the Hawaiian language in which it was originally, originally written or scribed, or in English, the language through which the text primarily circulates today. The easy availability of the English text, Hawaiian antiquities up until now, has shaped a particular understanding of Malo as a writer of Hawaiian traditions, as a historian. While this view is certainly a testament to the importance garnered by the publication of his manuscript, Kamo'olelo Hawaii, and the print medium through which knowledge continues to be authenticated, and the English language which still holds primacy today in our world, and in most scholarship on Hawaii, sadly, this limited view of Malo as a historian is not one that Malo's contemporaries held of him during his lifetime. So some of the quotes here at the top of this page are in fact that they are his own self description that he gives in a, in a public testimony in a court. But the quote below it, written by um, William Richards to Jeremiah, Jeremiah Evarts in 1828, told me something about the cast of David Malo's mind um, beyond sort of the data that Kapali and Kale have given us about his training, about, you know, in the court of Kuakini in Kamehameha, trained by a genealogist, all of those things. Richards is talking to us about how they translate the Bible. And when Richards doesn't understand a passage in the Bible, he asks Malo, hey, what about this word? And he describes in detail the back and forth that happens between him and Malo as they're discussing a passage in Hawaiian. And what caught my eye here is Richards saying that Malo is one of the most intelligent of people, of the people, a most valuable assistant in translating his knowledge of his own language, which of course we're gonna take issue with today, right? He knows the language, I'm not sure how he's the assistant. Um, but here's the interesting part, is able to give authorities for his use of words by reference to ancient Mele and Kaniko, is a valuable member of the church, is often consulted by the chiefs on important business and is esteemed by them as a good counselor. That last portion gave me the trace that maybe I should be looking for a life of David Malo that went beyond him being the author of this text. And also it gave me a place to start to develop a Hawaiian methodological approach to research, to thinking in Hawaiian, to thinking about Hawaiian intellectuals that I named a methodology called Kauna consciousness. And that's that ability to take words and their multiple meanings and relate them to usages and contexts without computers, without search engines, right? Which without the kinds of crutches that we have today through public kilo. So that was very um, interesting and important. The rich diversity of the written and published materials produced by and about Malo has been largely obscured by an over-reliance upon the publication of Kamo'olelo Hawaii, 
in translation. Um, so I have here a list of the very important moments in Malo's life where he gave advice to Ali'i and their images here, Ka'ahumanu, Matayo Ke Kuanao'a, Kina'u, and William Richards. Here's perhaps the most famous piece of advice he's given um, that's been recorded and repeated over and over and over again in um, Hawaiian scholarship. And it's this piece of advice that he gave to Kina'u and Matayo Ke Kuanao'a when they were facing difficulties with the French government over the expulsion of Catholic priests from the Hawaiian kingdom. Okay, so um, I wanna read the whole beautiful Hawaiian, but I don't think I have time for that. But he gives this, uh, when they say to him, Malo, please leave the Hainaluna, please come to Honolulu and give us advice in person on how to deal with these issues. He writes back a letter and says, I can't, I'm too busy at school. Sounds familiar, right, teachers? I'm too busy at school. So here's my advice. And the advice um, he gives in a letter in July and August of this year, 1837. And he tells them, I think that you must meet frequently for this is the reason. If a big wave comes in, large fishes will come from the deep ocean from a place unseen. And when they see the small fishes of the shallows, they will devour them. Such also is the case with large animals. They will prey on the smaller ones. Likewise, the ships of the white men have come and knowledgeable people have arrived from powerful countries which you have never seen before. They know our people are few in number and living in a small country. They will devour us, they will eat us up. Such has always been the case with large countries. The small ones have taken over throughout the world. So this tells me something about Malo's life. 1795 to 1853 spans a period of intense transformation in Hawaiian society. The casting down of the aikapu, the engagement of oral and oral literacy into print, the performatives that um, Kapali talked about, the slow movement of systems of Hawaiian knowledge and governance between legitimated and authoritative spoken and written forms, the introduction of Christianity and its adoption, the beginning of permanent foreign settlement after nearly 50 years of foreign transience. Malo was trained as to be a kaka olelo, one skilled at language, a chiefly counselor, and a vaihona ike, a repository of knowledge. And he was trained in the period before the couple was cast down. He was a man of 24 years already when that happened, studying the life of Malo as a native intellectual, provides readers with an important way to consider the difficulties faced by those who kept history and traditions in the face of much change. I have a lot more to say about the importance of this text in the world and the work that Kapali and Kali have done over their 20 year span is so important. Thank you very much uh, for having me. Aloha. Mahalo and Nui Lani. Who Nui Ka Ike, Nui Ka Ike, Nui Ka I, Nui Ka Ulu, and Akohoi, Aki Momanao, Mahalo Ya Oi, Mahalo Ya Uko. I'm always struggling in my work to try to go beyond the stereotypes that colonialism have given to us to think through what is a Hawaiian intellectual or what is the worth of Hawaiian knowledge. You know, certainly there is an insular turn that we wanna be talking about in, in imagining these figures as, a, as part of our pantheon of our own personal Hawaiian history. But I think it goes too far when we start to say things like, he's a hero, he's a patriot, this is his kuleana. Like, to try to append 21st century identitarian political categories to these people when the complexity of the world bursts all those boundaries. And I understand why we think we need them today, but those are ephemeral, right? So I think that I would ask the audience to, to take this question home with them, to think beyond the boundaries, the colonial, settler colonial or whatever, the, the, the nativist tendencies to look inward as a reaction because of all of the bad things that have happened, um, to think in a more capacious way about how this is a, is, is a, a, a literature of the world, belonging to the world. The intellectual um, things that Hawaiians did are amazing, right? Um, we have a couple more questions from our attendees. We want to get to that. And if we do go over time, I think the recording will stop. But those of you who are on Zoom with us, we can continue for a few minutes. So Nanette Napoleon asks, in recent years, some have dismissed Malo and Kamako because they became too biased by the missionaries. What do you say? 
I think I just sort of tried to answer that question. <laughs> right? That, that, okay. That, that people live, have a very complex life. And, and while the categories of us versus them, or, or, you know, it's very, it's very, um, what do you say? It's convenient to categorize somebody and demonize them and then say, well, then I don't have to read any of that. That's really simple. But if I had that approach to the missionaries, I wouldn't have gotten that quote from Mr. Richards. I wouldn't understand Malo in all of the multitudinous context in which his life played was re were relating to. So I, I tend not to, to try to reproduce the us thems because I'm thinking about Malo's life. You know? I'd like to jump in too. Yeah. I think that some of that is due to reading Emerson's um, <laughs> introduction in Hawaiian Antiquities, where he says that uh, Malo is brainwashed by missionaries. Um, and he attributes uh, ideas to Malo which are not in the manuscript. That, that was a problem we faced. I mean, when I, I, I had read the, uh, uh, the introduction to Emerson long before I learned Hawaiian. And when we actually started reading the Hawaiian, I was really quite surprised. Malo, uh, Emerson had given me the impression that Malo was a mission boy. Now that again, that's that's too superficial and easy to say, but he really he gave you that that impression. And as I read the manuscript, I thought, here is a man who's proud of his history. He looks to his history and it wants to use it intelligently and present it intelligently. Uh, in, in a sense, a, a, a remarkable mind working with traditional materials. Um, and and the whole theme that's come over from for many years that that many of these writers were were ploys or dupes. I don't think you can maintain that in the face of reading their materials themselves. These are very, very intelligent people who have been able to work uh, competently in under two very divergent systems. Most of us, I, I couldn't do that. Um, they certainly did. Uh, Kamakau is was nobody's fool about Hawaiian history. David Malo was not uh, was not sitting and listening to what Sheldon Dibble told him Hawaiian history was <laughs> all about. He was writing his own. They were the teachers when it came to Hawaiian history, not the students. Mahalo nui ya ukoa 